Well, thank you so much for being here today. I am Heidi Klumpkin, Youth Civic Engagement Coordinator for the League of Women Voters, Minnesota. Welcome to our third webinar related to the High School Voter Collaborative. If you are interested, you can view the other webinars on our League of Women Voters Minnesota YouTube. The goal of these webinars is to gather, learn, and share about elections, voter education, and civic engagement in Minnesota. We will go through a series of questions and then we would love to hear from you as well. Feel free to put your questions in the chat or raise your hand and we'll be um, recording this session until the public question time. You can also pin the speakers in the um, in the upper right hand corners so that um, they can stay large throughout the presentation. And also please stay muted unless you are asking questions. Are there other Zoom reminders that I should I think we're good? So today's theme is about reflections on the 2023 election season. Though 2023 wasn't a busy election year for everyone, there were plenty of local elections implementing the new legislation passed this spring. Today, we have two wonderful colleagues who will share some reflections on the season and as we look ahead to 2024. Melanie, is the, Melanie Hazlip is the Director of Voter Outreach for the Office of the Minnesota Secretary of State. Prior to that, Melanie worked with the League of Women Voters Minnesota, also in campaigns and in education. Melanie has spent the summer and fall sharing information and presentations about 2023, um, about the 2023 Minnesota legislative updates related to elections, and we so thank you for being here. Also with us today is Lydia McComas, Hennepin County's Division Manager for Voter Engagement. Lydia has also worked with other campaigns and in education. Lydia also spent her summer educating Minnesotans about recent changes to elections and about the importance of voting by writing articles, giving presentations, and being on the radio. Great thing is, those radio shows live on, and I listened to a few last night, so thank you so much. Uh, thank you for being here. A lot of... a. Uh, a lot of this election seasons, we see wall-to-wall -wall coverage of events, debates, campaigns, and more leading up to an election, and then months of analysis, analysis of the results. Through the work of people like our speakers and many of our attendees today, voter education happened all summer. However, analysis of the results and how that legislation impacted this election season hasn't been as prevalent in the news. Also, we are still collecting and analyzing that data. It's not quite done yet. I know Ramsey County always comes out with their report in March. So sometimes we have to wait a little bit longer. So we're still looking at the impact of this, uh, of this election season and collecting that data. But with that information we have, I was wondering if we could share some information of how the election season went for 2023. And so that is my first question to our speakers today. So I don't know if we want to have um, Lydia start with that, but how could you share how the election season went for 2023? And then we'll ask Melanie to share. Yeah, so um, on Hennepin County side, uh, it went really well. Um, we had a lot of um, great conversations with voters, um, especially around the uh, the new election laws that got passed. Um, we didn't see super high turnout in Hennepin County in our in our cities and our school districts who had elections, um, but we often don't see high turnout in in these uh, odd odd year elections. Um, so uh, so. But lots of people did vote and lots of people exercised their uh, right to vote for the very first time, um, which was exciting. And uh, and overall, the new election um, laws impacted us well. <laughs> they were positively um, uh, uh, received by voters and by election judges. Um, and so that was really exciting. So things went really smoothly on, on Election Day and leading up to Election Day. Melanie, any, anything to add? I would add just the same sentiment. Um, we don't have data from our office that we can share from 2023, from the odd year election, um, as far as turnout goes, or even a lot of people are asking, you know, how many people took advantage of restore the vote? And we don't have that kind of data either. Um, that one in particular requires overlapping data from various sources that our office doesn't have the capacity to do. We're hoping some community partners are going to do that um, into 2024. So. We don't really have hard numbers other than I can tell you uh, we had 24% of registered voters turn out. So not 24% of the total population of eligible voters, but of registered voters. That's the one data point that we do have. So it's a little bit, you know, that's a little bit skewed because it's a registered voters. But general 
enthusiasm for the new laws and doing voter engagement work was really high. It was uh, just really prevalent amongst community groups and partners, even folks who aren't the League of Women Voters or Hennepin Elections um, that, that do other things as their primary function um, are really interested in doing democracy work and voter engagement work. So that's, that's giving me a lot of hope leading into 2024. Um, there is a question that did come in the chat right away is how does that 24% compare to other years? Do you have that? I don't have that handy. I could try to dig that up, but I don't have that handy. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering that too. And I was also wondering if either of you, and I didn't send you this question ahead of time. So if we need to come back to it, um, with, with a few of the legislative laws going into effect in 2023, and then some not going to effect in 2024, was there ever any confusion or any clarification that needed to happen or any clarification we'll need to work on in 2024? We had a few, um, uh, questions, especially from community partners around what, what they should be telling, um, individuals around absentee ballots, uh, recurring absentee ballots around, um, the automatic voter registration. Um, but that was pretty easy to, to communicate, especially to our community partners. Um, and then, uh, and then we didn't hear a ton from voters around those things. I think that they heard a lot about restore the vote, a lot about pre-registration. And so those things sort of got ingrained. Um, and then the folks who are actually working on, on getting that information out, the laws out, um, we're more interested in, in trying to figure out how to how to communicate. So that's that's where some of the confusion came and some of the clar clarification came. I don't know if you have any other um, experience, Melanie. Um, you know, I think that there was some confusion around restore the vote just because people in that community, some people in that community have been told for years, if not decades, that they can't vote. And so there's a, a good chance that they're going to need to hear it more than once that they can in fact vote. And, and there's a reason to, to understand why they would be hesitant to believe that, you know, they don't want to get in trouble. Um, so that's, that has been something that we've really been trying to, to just continue to, to communicate and have communicated from various sources like League of Women Voters, other trusted sources, other trusted um, community partners and, you know, the Department of Corrections, but just really trying to make sure that we get that message across as, as frequently as possible so that voters do know that 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 is a change, that that law has changed and they will not get in trouble if they vote. Um, but otherwise, no, I would say questions about how laws will interact, like how automatic voter registration will interact with um, with both pre-registration or with driver's licenses for all in particular. But otherwise, no, I wouldn't. There hasn't been too much confusion so far. I feel like that's something that I've really started to share up front is that when you are either a new voter because of age or eligibility or other reasons it, to a new state, you always have to learn what your laws are in your certain area. So I've voted only in two states, Minnesota and Texas. So I'm really only familiar with those laws. And I feel like I think you're right with what we hear in the national news can be very different from what's happening locally. So emphasizing that our laws may be different from what you hear um, otherwise is really impactful. And also because there's changes like we saw this year with us, you know, there's lots of changes happening. Um, well, speaking of the laws, uh, and, and Lydia, you mentioned this a little bit, but the impact that some of the laws had, and Melanie, you mentioned we don't always have that data yet, but is there anything we foresee happening about the impact the laws have had on this election season? And we can skip ahead if, you're, if you we feel like we've addressed that. Okay, I was just going to say, uh, we do know that for pre-registration between June 1, when the law was implemented, and last week, there were 2,110 pre-registrations, um, which is fantastic. A little bit of a, a challenge with tracking this data is um, that once pre-registrations turn 18 and that registration is activated, they'll just get swept up in all of the other registrations. And so we'll kind of lose sight of who was pre-registered once they hit 18. But I did ask our data team to run those numbers. We do have that. So that was exciting. That's really exciting. Thank you. Thanks for having that, Melanie. I was looking at, I was trying to get that for us and I, I couldn't get it in time. Um, but anecdotally, we did see an increase um, at the end of August and uh, beginning of September with, um, with, 
teens starting school again. Um, and it's on like a lot of social studies teachers, civics te teachers, um, we're getting, we're getting those 16, 17 year olds pre-registered. So that was really exciting. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the things that I was so excited about talking with, um, people this summer about uh, a lot of teenagers, when they would come to our stand, they'd be like, Oh, like, can I have a tote bag? Can I have a water bottle? Like I can't vote yet. Like, well, you can actually pre-register to vote. Did you know that? And so, um, so they were really excited about that. So getting that word out, um, giving them our QR code to, to go register and having them hand it out to their friends was, was really exciting. And I was just going to add, um, a huge thanks to Lee Wim Voters Partners, the local chapters who accompanied us when Secretary Simon went to visit high schools. I see some names of the participants who were there pre-registering folks as Secretary Simon, pre-registering the, the students as Secretary Simon was presenting. Um, I think it made a tremendous impact to have the League of Women Voters volunteers there pre-registering while Secretary Simon was presenting. That was That was a very, very good partnership. Um, we did get that question in the chat. So you've mentioned uh, the work that we all do together to make sure that we're registering voters and that voter education around these new laws. Can you talk a little bit about some of the other community partners you work with and how you can, yourselves can also engage with voters, how you can make sure you have this? Um, Lydia, you mentioned tabling, but are there other programs that you do? Yeah, so we, um, I, I know that you, you all know this at League of Women Voters, but we have a community uh, partner contract program that we do. Um, so this year we had 10 organizations that we worked with. Um, next next year we'll have um, uh, around 20 plus organizations that we'll contract with um, who we actually give money to to do voter outreach work. Um, and they're often more trusted in the community um, and have uh, better contacts in the community than we do, um, especially around some of this restore the vote stuff where um, people really have to trust that that they can vote and if they're hearing it from someone that they trust um, they'll be more likely to actually vote so that's that's one way um, one big big way that we've been getting out this information um, and we've been doing that since since 2020 um, to to get to people um, but we've also been doing like you said lots of um, tabling events um, we've been at all of our Hennepin County libraries doing outreach events um, we've been tapping into our resources um, internally to have Hennepin County staff be sort of conduits of this information we have so many staff who are on sort of the front lines we're public facing um, our service center staff our library staff um, our parole officers they all have uh, this this new information about restore the vote about uh, um, pre-registration uh, so that's been really exciting to sort of arm them with that, with that knowledge and power to um, to give to to residents of, of the county. So that's one. That's another way that we're doing that. Melanie, do you want to talk a little bit about the outreach efforts that you've all been doing? Yeah, sure. Um, so we've approached it from several different tracks, depending on which law we're doing the outreach on. Um, a lot of it has to do with just getting it out in the press, making sure that both the statewide press and then local press sources are um, picking up the stories wherever Secretary Simon goes and does a presentation or visits, that, that they're picking it up because that's a great way for us to get it into the local communities. Um, and then we have just hundreds of partners across the state, all four corners of the state mm -hmm. that I'm communicating with all year round. Some of you who are on this call, maybe receive those emails from me. Um, I will actually put my email in the chat. If you don't receive emails from me and you'd like to get on my list, please send me your email address and I'll happily add you to that list. Um, so I work with partners across the state to make sure that they have the information so that they can give it to their communities. Um, the, the, the folks who are providing services in the communities and who are on the ground in the communities are the trusted messengers. You know, we have the trusted information from the office, but the people who are in the communities doing the work, whether it is working at a food shelf or working for an organization that provides rent assistance, you know, like I said before, it doesn't have to be specific to voter engagement work, but those community groups are really the trusted messengers in communities across the state. And so we work to train them on the new laws and give them the tools that they need to make sure they can put it into communities. Um, and then for some of the other laws, we work in partnership with other state agencies. So um, for Restore the Vote, it has been heavy with the Department of Corrections, who've been fantastic. Attorney General Ellison's office has also been great. Um, so really just utilizing partners in 
um, all all kinds of different areas that where we can. And I know that as you go throughout the state, you get to meet with these partners, but also lots of other people and engage with, um, and even just across Hennepin County. So I wanted to make sure to ask that while you were traveling and sharing the information and engaging with uh, with voters, um, what was something memorable that happened this summer and fall? Uh, something like an impactful visit or a memorable conversation, new favorite foods or a favorite restaurant or something like the best ice cream place. I don't know. It doesn't have to be ice cream focused, but anything else? Uh, well, I can tell you when I went to Mankato with Secretary Simon, we had delicious bagel sandwiches. Um, they were amazing. Um, but that was a really fun trip because um, it was kind of a standard Secretary Simon trip. He visited the high school there. He visited the college and then he visited with community groups, um, which really gave us the opportunity to reach all kinds of different populations and their um there is an effort down there, which is heavily led by League of Women Voters members down there who wear different hats uh, called Lead the Vote. And their goal is to get nonprofits in the Mankato area engaged in voter outreach work. Um, so they're they're trying to pull in all the nonprofits in the area and, and help educate them on how they can do voter engagement work. You know, some nonprofits are afraid that they can't, that it's too political and trying to make sure that they know, you know, what the laws are for uh, doing nonpartisan voter engagement and giving them the tools. And so that was a really inspiring event to attend, just hearing of all the amazing services and things that these groups are providing for the community, and then learning that they want to do more and, and helping their communities vote. So that one, that was, that one sticks out to me. That is really great. I think we've got a couple of people from Mankato here today. So if you remember anything as well, make sure you put it in the chat or raise your hand later on. Um, Lydia, would you like to share? Yeah. Um, so we uh, we did an event this summer with Catholic Charities um, at one of their shelters. Uh, it was a community assessment. So we went in um, to sort of ask questions about barriers to voting, especially for people experiencing homelessness. Um, and we had around 15 people join that meeting and we provide lunch and, and snacks and that kind of thing. And, um, and it was really awesome to hear how many people were up to date on the election laws and were excited about voting and excited about um, telling their uh, their fellow uh, sh shelter mates or whatever uh, other people in the shelter about voting. Um, and that was awesome. And it was also awesome. I don't know. I don't think I told you this, Melanie, but one of them had seen our bus ads. Um, we put big restore the vote um, uh, ads. That was a joint effort between our um, office and, and the secretary of state. And so that was um, that was really heartwarming to know that um, uh, folks are are excited about voting and we're excited about being um, peer, uh, peer to peer um, uh, educators and that kind of thing. So that was, that was one of my favorite um, experiences this summer. Well, that is so cool. I love that. I also feel like um, I was sometimes surprised at what people had heard and what people hadn't heard. And we did have somebody put in the chat that their students, um, the one of the leagues, their student fellows, their school students um, did a survey where only 38% of the students knew about the pre-registration and 28% of the 16 and 17 year olds had registered in that area then. And then we did get another question too about engagement outside of schools. And I was wondering, Lydia, if you could talk a little bit about um, the student election or the election judge trainee program and how we can engage beyond pre-registration and other ways that people can be involved in elections before they turn 18. Um, and I don't, and maybe, I know the law changed the name officially from student election yeah. judge to election judge trainee, but I don't know if anything else changed in the rules or if it was just the title. Mel, I think there, I think maybe a couple other things changed, Melanie, you and I think there's like a, a gap but Melly, you'll know more about that. <laughs> there was um, there was like a loophole where if graduation and when somebody turned 18, mm -hmm. there was a loophole there. And so that just closed that loophole so that they could still actually serve, that those 18 year olds could still actually serve. Mm -hmm. Like in the primary in August. No, in the general, actually. Um, so it, it's the, it allows you to extend. Oh, okay. That's the voice of yeah. Michael Wall, if people don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Easily recognizable. Hey, yeah. um, 
<laughs> um, so we uh, we are trying to get more students um, uh, involved. A lot of times students come up to our outreach tables and they're excited to pre-register or they are already pre-registered. They're like, okay, what else can I do? I've got two years until I turn 18. What else can I do? Um, so we first say, okay, tell your classmates about pre-registration. Um, but also if you want to get more involved, you can be um, an election judge, a trainee student. Um, you can be an election judge and that's a great way to get involved. Um, you can do volunteer hours for that. I know lots of students need that. Um, but then also for, we're really trying to reach um, young people for elections, especially March elections when um, when maybe there's snowbirds, uh, regular election judges who aren't around. Um, so if you know any students who are interested, they should reach out to their city or their county um, to, to get involved with that. But yeah, we are trying to reach, reach young people. And I know Melanie, you're, um, I think maybe you have a student election judge or you have, um, you've got uh, uh, more information about that. Is there anything else you need, wanted to add around student election judges or election judge trainees, sorry. No, okay. oh, I just I, the hook that I always use is you can skip school and get paid <laughs> for <laughs> students. That's that's how I always frame it. It's usually that's usually helpful. Mm -hmm. As somebody who I remember my first election judge experience was with a student election judge. I wasn't, but the other person was, well, now an election judge trainee. And it was really, really great to hear how like their their teacher had engaged them to um, think about this process and uh, engage with this. And then their whole family came to see them working. It was really cool. <laughs> I really liked it. Um, well, thinking ahead a little bit, and um, I'm going to combine these two questions um, because I feel like I wanted to ask for sure, did we learn anything for 2024? Like as we move forward with these new laws and going thing, did we learn anything to apply to 2024? And then what are you looking forward to in 2024? So what did we learn in 2023 to apply to 2024? And what are you looking forward to in 2024? I can start. Um, so I think a few of the things that we learned, um, the laws work as long as people know about them. <laughs> so we we really just need the help from community partners across the state to continue getting the word out. That's um, you know, that's that's the work ahead in 2024. Um there's a, a real growing enthusiasm for democracy work. There is an enthusiasm amongst foundations to um, provide funding for democracy work. There's an enthusiasm amongst nonprofits and community groups in reaching out for funding to, to do democracy work. There really is an enthusiasm around it, which is really encouraging. Um, I think we can, if we just need to keep building on that momentum and keep building partnerships and building on that momentum. Um, to, to try to light a fire under all of you on this call. In case you didn't know, we're voter, we're, we're number three in voter turnout. We were number one for several years in a row. And in 2022, we dropped to number three, just barely, just barely, but we did, we dropped to number three. So we're really hoping to get back to number one. Secretary Simon really wants to get back to number one, but that can be a little bit of a motivator. And then, um, you know, Sadly, what we've learned is that misinformation and disinformation is really still a problem. And it's something that we're going to continue to prioritize on how to address and how to combat from our office. And it's another thing that we just really need community partners and trusted voices to help us try to fight misinformation and disinformation. I, I've got some bullet points, not as eloquent as, as Mel needs, but um, some, some of the folks from my office wanted to share that um, we're seeing an increase in 16 and 17 year old registering with, um, online. Uh, we're seeing a, a big decrease in paper applications, um, which is, is uh, fine, which is good administratively for us that's nice paper applications are great um but that's that's just an interesting thing to to note um the majority of paper applications that we're getting are from registration drives so just wanted to share that um that's something that we learned um we also uh we have been doing a lot of um social media engagement a lot of um paid advertisement um and we're seeing a really good um engagement on inst instagram especially between 18 and 24 year olds uh, we can't target any, any younger than 18. Uh, there's laws against that. Um, but we are seeing really good engagement um, with 18 to 24 year olds around uh, restore the vote pre-registration. So we'll continue that for, for 20, uh, 2024. 
Um, we're also looking forward to new assisted voting devices next year. We're going to pilot a new a new uh, device at the government center. So that's really exciting. Um, and we're looking forward to doing some outreach around that, um, especially with some of our um, disability advocacy partners, especially uh, Federation of the Blind and um, and a couple other organizations. So we're really looking forward to that. Um, we've heard some some feedback on our current machines. Uh, so we're, we're hoping that this new machine might be better. Um, we're also looking forward to seeing the impact of the student housing list on, on the big election year next year um, and seeing how that how that impacts students, how that maybe makes um, voting easier for, for them and, and the administration administrative burden for, for election judges may be a little a little lower. So those are some things, but Melanie's were um, were maybe a little a little more concise, a little clearer, more exciting. <laughs> I mean that's why we all work together, right? Because we all have different things that we can support and work with each other about. <laughs> um, Michael did put the statute in the chat about the election, the election judge trainee. Um, and that is there. Um, I have one more question before we open it up to everybody else. And you've already touched on this, but I wonder if you could expand it a little bit about what we as attendees to this can do to help prepare and educate for 2024. Melanie, you've already mentioned about making sure we continue the information about misinformation and making sure that's out there. But is there anything else like a, a thing we can take away from this conversation? What can we do to prepare and educate for 2024? I would add specifically educating about the presidential nominating primary. Um, you know, the general election in November is, of course, very important, but the presidential nominating primary is on March 5th, um, the PNP, I'll say it for short. And voting for the PNP starts on January 19th, which is 45 days away, if you're counting. So that's right around the corner. Um, and, and it's only the second time that Minnesota has done a PNP. Um, I was not in this office when, when we did it the first time. Michael, I believe was, so probably has all kinds of stories and uh, answers for folks, but I, it's, a, it's a new, it's still a relatively new process and voters will need information about it. They have questions about it, they need information. It only applies to the presidential candidates. The local and statewide candidates will still have caucuses, so that could be confusing. Um, from what I understand, in 2020, voters were upset about having to select a party to receive the ballot. Um, you have to you, you have to choose which party you want to receive the ballot for, and so voters want to want information about that. Um, so that's that's another area where we could really use help with outreach. Um, we don't quite have the outreach materials created yet, but just started the conversations today about what those outreach materials will be. And, and once I have them, I will share them far and wide. So we will try to make it easy to do to do the education work, but that's where we'll need some help too. Yeah, that is something that I really appreciated this fall is anytime you had new materials available, getting that email was really helpful to be able to share that and making sure we had the right, the accurate information to share out with everybody else. So I appreciate, appreciate all that coming from your office too. Lydia, did you want to share some things? What yeah, I'll just reiterate, um, just making sure that folks, if they have questions about elections or if they have if they have some misinformation, but they want they want to know what's accurate, send them over to our office. We have um, great customer service support um, and we have the answer. So if they want to hear it from us, um, we we're here. Um, and if you have questions about elections or you're hearing um, uh, election misinformation, disinformation, let us know. We can chat with you all about um, the, the accurate information. Uh, we can get you talking points um, and we can, we can, uh, and it'll be good for us to know too, so that we can sort of put out the good information. Um, so yeah, 